please join me in, a, in, a, in prayer to the throne this morning. Father, we pause before you this morning to give you praise, dear Father, because you are an awesome God, great God. We know you promise never to leave us and you will be with us no matter how high or how far. And we know, we feel it daily that you are with us. And we ask you, dear Lord, to bless each and every one of us, those in Zoom land, our friends, neighbors, families. We thank you and we give you praise and honor this morning. Brethren, it's a beautiful thing when we can come together in peace and unity to give God praise and thanks, you know, and worship him in spirit and in truth. Today, my message will be from the gospel of Matthew, and we are going to look at chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. And I believe there is no better source than when we can take some words from Christ and expound upon it. And I'd like to, to begin verse 14. Here we find Jesus said, you are the lights of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It may be well said that this is the greatest compliment that was ever paid to an individual Christian. For in it, Jesus commands the Christian to be what he himself claimed to be. And he said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world in John 9, 5. Now, when Jesus commanded his followers to be the lights of the world, he demanded nothing less than that they should be like him. Brethren, my question today is, how many of us really understand and take what Jesus is saying seriously. Now to help us understand what Jesus is saying and to obey him, we must do an analysis of this passage. And for my title, I call this one, The Light of the World Shining for Jesus Christ. First of all, by way of an introduction, when Jesus spoke these words, he was using an expression that was quite familiar to the Jews who heard it for the first time. They themselves spoke of Jerusalem as a light to the Gentiles. By the way, in which the Jews used this expression will give us a key to the way in which Jesus also used it. But one thing, the Jews were very sure, no man kindled his light on his own. Now, in Jerusalem was indeed a light to the Gentiles, but God lit Israel's lamp. The light with which the nation or the man of God shone was borrowed light. 
And that must be the case with Christians. It is not the demand of Jesus that we should, as it were, produce our own light. We must shine with the reflection of his light. The radiance which shines from the Christian must come from the presence of Christ within our hearts. And let us do this analysis now and get a better look at this picture. When Jesus said that the Christian must be the light of the world, what did he mean? And we have four points to ponder. Point number one, a light is first and foremost something which is meant to be seen. Now, in the houses in Palestine were very dark inside with only one little circular window, perhaps not more than 18 inches across. And the lamp was like a sauce boat filled with oil and with a wick floating in it. And it was not easy to rekindle a lamp in those days before matches and those little flicks that we have these days. Now, normally the lamp stood on the lamp stand, which would be no more than a roughly shaped branch of wood. But when people went out, for safety's sake, they took the lamp from its stand and put it under an earthen bushel so that it might burn without the risk, without risk until they returned. Now, the primary duty of the light of the lamp was to be seen. Brethren, Christianity should be visible to all men. Christianity should be visible not only within the church, it should be even more visible in the ordinary activities of this world. Our Christianity should be visible in several ways. A, in the way that we treat the shop associate across the counter, in the restaurant, how we order a meal, in the way we treat employees or serve our employers, in the way we play a game or drive a car or even parking in the lot. Now, the, in the daily language that we use, also in the literature we read, those beautiful movies and videos, uh, and these are just a few. A Christian should be just as much as a Christian in the factory, the workshop, the shipyard, the schoolroom, hospital, even in the kitchen or on the golf course, the playing fields as he is in church. Brethren, Jesus did not say, you are to be the lights of the church. He said, you are to be the lights of the world. And that leads to point number two. A light is a guide. On any navigable river, we may see the lines of lights which marks the channel for the ships to sail in safety. We know how difficult even in our city streets, when there's a problem with the traffic lights, traffic could be sometimes completely stopped. A light is something to make clear the way. Most people understand the blue flashing lights on the highway, especially when you are driving 75 or 80 miles per hour in a speed limit zone that calls for 55 to 65. 
all of a sudden, as if in slow motion, the traffic before you starts building up and building up and tempers are flying, but everybody obeys in front of you. So then, the Christian must make the way clear for others. And that is to say, a Christian must of necessity be an example. He must be a shining light. One thing which this world needs more than anything else is people who are prepared to be examples of goodness. Suppose we have a group of people and suppose it's suggested that some unquestionable thing should be done. Unless someone makes a protest, the thing will be done. Everyone will chip in. But if someone rises up and says, I'm not, be, I'm not gonna be a party to that, another and another and another will step up and say, neither will I. But had they not been given the lead, they would have remained silent and a job will be done. You see, there are many people who don't have the moral courage and strength to take a stand for themselves. But if someone gives them a lead, they will follow. If they have someone strong enough to lead on, to lean on, they will do the right things. Brethren, it is the Christian duty to take the stand, which the weaker brother will support. To give the lead, which those with less courage will follow. Now, the world needs its guidance lights. There are many people waiting and longing for a lead to take the stand to do things which they themselves do not dare to do. And that leads to point number three. A light can often be a warning light. A light is often the warning which tells us to halt when there's danger ahead. It's something the Christian duty it's sometimes the Christian duty to bring his fellow men the necessary warning, even though that is often difficult and hard to do in a way which will not do more harm than good. But one of the most poignant tragedies in life is for someone, especially a young person, to come and say to you, you know, Mr. Jones or Miss, Miss Henry, I would have never been in this situation if someone had only spoke up. Someone had only come and said to me, what I was doing is wrong. Brethren, there is a young woman by the name of Florence Alshon. She was a famous teacher and principal. And it is said that she never rebuked a student for something they had done wrong without embracing them. She put her arms around them and then she chastised them, but with love. Now, brethren, if our warnings are given, not in anger, not in irritation, not in criticism or condemnation, nor desire to hurt, but in love, our chastisement will be effective. And point number four, last but not least, Jesus said, let your lights shine before men, that they may see your good works 
and give glory to your Father in heaven. And in this juncture, we have two important things. Number one, men are to see our good deeds. In the Greek, there are two words for good. Agathos, which defines a thing as good quality, which is something that we all desire to have, good quality and cheap. <laughs> and the other word is kalos, which means that the thing is not only good, but that it is also beautiful, attractive, and it seems to have value to it. You know, there are two kinds of goodness in this world. The tragedy of so much so-called goodness is that in it, there is an element of hardness and coldness and austerity. You know, there is a goodness which attracts and a goodness which repels. There's a charm in true Christianity's goodness, which makes it a lovely thing. Our good deeds ought to draw attention, but not to ourselves, but to God. The Christian never thinks of what he has done, but of what God has enabled him to do. You know, the Christian never seeks to draw the eyes of men to himself, but always to direct them to God. Whatever we do, whatever we say, should be uplifting. It should be encouraging. And you know, quite often, when people see you are demonstrating a different personality, a personality with quality and humility, I believe at times they don't just think about how smart you are or how, but they try to figure out something is what's propelling you to come with these qualities because this is not something that you'll find dime a dozen. Brethren, in conclusion, we had four points to ponder. Number one, a light is first and foremost something which is to be seen. Number two, a light is a guide. Three, a light can often be a warning light. And four, let your light shine before men. And the final analysis is the answer to the question, what did Jesus mean when he said, we are the light of the world? It is that he is the light of the world and we are to be like him. An imitation of him out of light must be, our light must be the reflection and the radiance which comes from the presence of God's Holy Spirit dwelling within us. By ourselves, I believe we are dull because sometimes so many things get us down. But when we have that light shining in us, the radiance of Christ beaming, we will face Goliath at times and slay the giant. But we cannot do it by ourselves. And when men see our good works, they will glorify our Father who is in heaven. So brethren, I hope that this will kindle or rekindle our lights and let us shine for Jesus. I'd like to just close with a short prayer. Father, we thank you so much for enlightening us and blessing us. And Lord, as we walk this journey, we ask you to continue walking with us 
unlightable path. May your words be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we give you praise and honor and thank you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. amen.